No. <laughs> All right. I uh, I asked him to 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 pull out both of those last two songs, the the Cast and Crowns Who Am I song and and the Bill Gaither Family of God. It's the same message uh, in both songs. Very different, very different songs, but the same message and something we want to kind of hit on this morning. Um, turn to Galatians chapter four. Uh, by reminder, we're working our way backwards through Galatians, but. Um, we're going to focus in on two verses this morning here in Galatians 4, and then we're going to kind of back away a little bit to see the bigger picture that Paul is painting for the folks um, here in Galatia. So, so look with me, Galatians 4, let me read two verses, verse 8 and verse 9. I'll give you a second to focus in on those. Um, Galatians 4, verse 8, Paul says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who were by nature not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them over again? Those weak and miserable forces. The King James calls them weak and beggarly elements. I like that term, beggarly. But what, what this actually refers to is what we talked about last week. What he's talking about here is the Judaic law. Those are the, the, the elements, the forces that the Galatians were accepting now as a part of their faith in Jesus. And, and mind you, all of this writing in Galatians really revolves around this, this movement toward legalism. But there's a couple of things that Paul says here that are so foundational to our faith that I really want us to look at them this morning. Some things that are fundamental to us, but I don't, maybe we just don't think about them too often. In particular, the first half of verse 9. So let me read that again. He says, now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Let's talk about that. What Paul says initially is the heart of Christianity, right? That you know God. That's the difference between saved and lost, between believer and pagan. That's the difference between being in the family of God and out of the family of God. When we come to that point and accept Christ, when we claim our affiliation with that name, when we say, I believe, we are coming to a point where we know God. There's a really interesting story in John chapter 8, which is pretty fascinating. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees in addition to people who believe in him. It's kind of a, a mixed crowd. And, and the Pharisees are arguing over Jesus' testimony uh, where he calls himself the light of the world. And it's in this conversation that Jesus turns to those who believe and gives us that wonderful teaching of you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But as this conversation develops, the Jews who don't believe him actually call him a Samaritan and demon possessed, which I find fascinating. But Jesus' immediate response to that is, uh, he says, I'm not demon possessed and you uh, are dishonoring me by saying the, these kind of things, and I'm just trying to honor my father. And, and this conversation develops, and in a few verses, here's what Jesus says to them. He says, though you do not know him, I know him. Now think about that. Jesus is addressing Pharisees. That's the holier than thou crowd in his day. He's addressing Jews who, by their very affiliation with Abraham, their being descendants of him, automatically assume a relationship with God. Overall, he's talking to people who believe in the law. They may not do it, but they believe in it. And in all of this, Jesus says to that crowd, you do not know God. That's amazing. That's powerful. And it's a big slap in their collective faces. You see, rules and laws and what you claim to believe does not necessarily create a relationship with God. That's what Jesus just said to these folks. To Christians, I would say a little different, and that is an affiliation with a church, regular attendance at that facility does not necessarily mean a relationship with God. One of my favorite old sayings is sitting in a church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage makes you a car. Or as I've heard somebody say recently, sitting in a pond makes you a duck. So Jesus says to these who abide by the law, you don't know God. But now put this conversely to what Paul says to the Galatians who have come to know Christ. He says, you do know God. Well, see, there's the answer. We know God by knowing Jesus. But then Paul throws in this little extra piece here. And I love that he does this. He says, you know God, but rather you are known by God. 
Now I can't really get into his mind and speak to his motivation or false motivation, but, but the wording, you know, God, or rather are known by God, or as the King James says of God. Think about that in light of that song by casting crowns. It's not because of what I am, but because of what you've done. See, this is the interesting twist here. And most commentaries that I read say that Paul did this because he didn't want to leave the impression that the Galatian salvation was something that they had done. It wasn't because of them. It wasn't a, a legalistic decision on their part to come to God, but rather it was a work of God in sending Jesus. And yes, they now knew God as, as, as shown uh, in, in the life and teachings of Jesus, but more than that, they were known by God. And as far as I'm concerned, this beautiful addition by Paul speaks to relationship, to this personalized, intimate, back and forth working relationship with God that we get to enjoy today. That's Christianity. It's not reading a list of, of rules and, and obeying them. It's not, it's, it's knowing God and being known by God, able to have conversation, uh, being able to, to feel his presence, being able to, to see his guidance, loving him and being loved by him. And you don't get that in the law. You only get that in a walk with Jesus. So Paul says, how, how is it that you folks who know God and are known by God can turn back so easily to those, those weak and beggarly elements? Let's talk about the Galatians themselves for a minute. We haven't done this. We talked about where they are. They're in modern-day Turkey, uh, Asia Minor in those days. But these are the folks that would be known as the Gauls. They were a people who worshipped a very mixed bag of religion. Primarily in Jesus' day, they were kind of revolving around the Roman gods, and there would have been temp Roman temples and, and sacrifices and rules to follow for those Roman gods. There were some Jews in the area too, folks who had uh, migrated up and out of Israel and settled there. But all of these folks were coming out of what I call a rule-infested religion. And I say that just so that you know that why Paul keeps chastising them for turning back to a legalistic way is because that's where they'd been. That's what they'd come out of when they'd accepted Christ. Now, in light of that thought, let's go back to verse 8 in Galatians. Galatians 4, verse 8, he says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. So this is a reference to their life prior to accepting Jesus, formerly when you did not know God. In other words, before you came to believe in Jesus. And Paul says, in those days, you were slaves to those things that are not God's by nature. Now, that's small g God, you understand, and that would have included the, the small g gods of the Romans, Mars, the god of war, Jupiter, the, the, the king of the gods, and, and god of lightning and thunder, Mercury, god of travelers, and tradesmen, and on and on goes the list. These were make-believe. These were idols. These were things that, that I guess gave their world a sense of some sort of order in the universe. But that was then. <laughs> but understand, you and I kind of fumble that ball the same way sometimes today. You know, we're not going to pagan temples and making sacrifice, but we do fall back on, on and maybe hold in too high esteem sometimes some things that comfort us that are not God's. Those things can be family traditions or certain beliefs or political holdings or even religious interpretation that are not necessarily biblical, but they comfort us, so we hold on to them. Our televisions are, by nature, not God's, but they get a lot of time in our lives. Our computers and other devices are, by nature, not God's, but get looked at probably too often. We can do this with sports. We can do this with entertainment. We just have to be careful to not become enslaved to something that's not our big G God. And it's not that we can't enjoy other things. It's not that we can't have some diversions in our life. It's, it's just that we have to be careful to not elevate those things and those activities and those beliefs, one, to a level that allows, us, allows them to consume us, and two, replaces our faith in Jesus. That's the path the Galatian people were on. They had come into a relationship with Jesus through the Holy Spirit, and they were abandoning it for more layers of religion rather than more love in their relationships. And we need to figure out if there's if there are some things in our life that we are elevating to God's stature, we need to get them out and be done with that. Now, I want to back up a little farther here. We're going to go and look at the last four verses of chapter three and examine this idea of our relationship with God. Um, 
and understand this is kind of fundamental to our walk. We need to understand how we're related to God in order to fully live in that relationship, in order to experience the freedom we have in Christ. And of course, it's that freedom that carries us over into growing into the fruit of the Spirit. So how are we related to God? All right, back up. Galatians chapter 3, the last four verses, beginning of verse 26, Paul says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. I, I love that verse. In Christ Jesus, we are all children of God through faith. For all of us who were baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is male and female. Uh, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, let's understand what, what Paul is saying here. Clearly, we're not melded into one big blob of human flesh that's all identical with each other, right? Thankfully, uh, there's still male and female. There's still Jew and Gentile. Uh, we may not have slave or free, but we certainly have people enslaved to some sins and other people enslaved to other sins. And we certainly as Christians are at all levels of income and power and influence in our society. Paul's words here do not say that we are not all different. Paul's words here do not say that we lose our uniqueness. Paul's point is that as children of God, baptized into Jesus, clothed with Jesus, in that understanding, when we come before God, that those things don't matter. They fall way down the line of importance. God doesn't see those things as much as he sees our heart. What stands as important to God is the relationship that we have in Christ. And he says here, we are all one in Christ Jesus. Let me give you a couple other verses that support that over in Colossians. Uh, Colossians 3.11, Paul says, here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, he says, for we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Paul's point is that we may occupy different spaces as people. We may have different roles to play. Um, we may have different gifts. But in all that, in all those things that make us uniquely us, there is one spirit, and it's the spirit of Jesus Christ. And that spirit unifies us and, and connects us and blesses us and empowers us to do the work, to experience our freedom, to grow into that fruit of the spirit. That's the relationship. We are children of God. We are seeds of Abraham. That is to say, we, have, we are born of his faith and heirs according to that promise. M most of us who are a little older have probably inherited something at this point in our life, whether a, a family heirloom, something special to some aunt or uncle or grandparent, maybe something bigger, the house or the whole estate. To inherit something is to make it yours, right? Permanently and practically yours, no longer the possession of someone else. Well, Paul says we are heirs to the seed of Abraham. We have inherited the legacy of his faith. We have inherited the legacy of his righteousness. We have inherited the legacy of his walk with God. That's ours. That's our faith walk. That's pretty cool, don't you think? Abraham's faith is our faith because we are in Christ. Verse 29, the last verse of chapter 3, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now let's cross over to chapter 4 because Paul's going to really dig into this idea of being an heir here. This is kind of interesting. Chap <clears throat> excuse me, chapter 4, verse 1, what I'm saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he's no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. Well, this is intriguing. So there's this comparison between an underage heir and a slave. Now, clearly an eight-year-old, if he should inherit a, a great manufacturing empire, isn't capable of, of running that empire. So there are guardians and trustees. The King James calls them tutors and governors responsible people to oversee a child's inheritance. And Paul finds the underage heir and the slave comparable because both are told what to do. So what Paul's saying here in the long run, he's saying that all of us are like that underage heir or the slave to the world. 
that we are all under the control of something other than the spirit of God, in particular, what he calls those elemental spiritual forces. Uh, there's a lot of debate as to what that means. I think clearly in light of everything else that he's said here in Galatians, we can assume that he's talking about the law. And that becomes our problem. We allow ourselves to be ruled by any number of things, even if it's seemingly good thing like the law or something really bad like the works of the flesh, all of it being those elemental spiritual forces and none of it speaking to a maturity in our faith. So if we say, if we stay there or retreat back from it, we stay as that underage heir and we live as a slave. When we allow the world to dictate our thoughts and our responses to things and our attitude toward people, well, that's the world that humanity has lived in since the fall of man. So when the time was right, God stepped in. When the time was right, look at verse 4, Galatians 4.4, 4, when the time set had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Jesus takes us out from under the law, out from under that burden. Jesus redeems us, and he gives us sonship. Do you realize how wonderful that is? I mean, look back, chapter 3, 26, it says, in Christ Jesus, you're all children of God. Here in, in chapter 4, verse 4 of in time, in times God, God sent Jesus so we could receive adoption to our sonship. And because of that, you are his children. You are his children. And because you are his children, verse 6, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. What an amazing thing that God has done, that we can say, Abba, Father, the family of God. Let's talk about Abba. I, I tend to hear this described as a word that a small child would use, <clears throat> comparable to daddy. Um, that's actually kind of a part of this, but it's not really a good representation of that word. Um, this is a word that Jesus uses in the garden, according to Mark's gospel, when he talks to Abba Father there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, Paul talks about Abba Father in Romans, uh, but more so than as a small child would use the word, it really speaks to family. It speaks to family relationship, and I know I probably overused that word, but I'm going to tell you something. We have got to get it into our heads that our walk with God is a relationship walk, because if it's not, we're not where we need to be with God. That's what this whole passage is about, relationship, sonship, being children of God. So Abba is this warm, intimate relationship word. No slave would have ever called his master Abba. It would not have been proper or reasonable, but a son, a daughter, a child of God. That song that we sang, joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. I love that little chorus. That's the picture that Paul is painting for the Galatians, because that's how Paul saw it. That, that's the reality of our walk with God. That's the very reality the Galatians were abandoning by thinking less about God's grace and more about God's rules. Verse 7 says, you are a child of God and heir. Verse 8 says, you used to be slaves to those things, not God's. And verse 9, where we started, now you know God and are known by God. The same can be said for you and I in our faith walk. We know God. We are known by God. What on earth do we do with that glorious message of truth? Well, we have the same options as the Galatians. We can live in this wonderful and uh, inherited intimate relationship with Jesus. We can live as sons and daughters, children of God. We can know the intimacy of Abba, or we can regress into an institution of rule and sacrifice and attendance and little else. Our joy will be limited in that. Our care for one another will be limited in that, but we'll do the rules and we'll feel good about ourselves. But we fall victim easily to the works of the flesh rather than grow as God's fruit when we do that. Galatians 3.26, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Let me share a little poem. I'd rather be family than a stranger to God. 
I'd rather walk with Jesus. To be left out would be odd. A church is wonderful. I enjoy each meeting. But a building without love is just spiritual cheating. I'm a child of God. Praise him for that. And I love that he knows me and knows where I'm at. That's the relationship given to us in Jesus. We are not slaves. We are not outsiders. We are not strangers. We need to live our life like we truly understand that sonship, like we truly know our God and are known by our God. And when we do, when we carry that out into society, we may not change the world, but we can change our little piece of it. And that's all we're really asked to do. All right, pray with me. Father, thank you this morning for this message. Thank you for these, these beautiful terms that Paul was sharing with the Galatians that you have spared and carried through the years to share with us. Thank you, Father, that we can call you Abba. Thank you, Father, that we share in Abraham's uh, inheritance. Thank you, Father, that we are your children, your sons and your daughters. Thank you for this family that we are a part of. And I pray, God, I know the, I know this family, like every other family, even gets dysfunctional once in a while, and we kind of go off the deep end and get a little crazy. But Father, we are still family, and you are our Father, and you love us, and you care about us, and we love each other, and we care for each other. And I just pray, God, that we can live in that and, and rest in that, and Father, beyond living there, that we can expand this family through our own faith walk and our own faith talk by, by sharing what we know about you. Abba, Father, thank you for loving us. Bless this congregation. Bless these folks. Pull them in tighter. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Listen, if you don't know what it is to be a child of God, if you don't understand this concept of sonship, please call me this week. We'll talk about that. We'll bring you into this family because it's a glorious thing. And, and if you're a part of the family and you know it and you know how glorious it is, maybe you have kind of stepped away from it and, and uh, maybe become more like the prodigal where well, I'm not sure. I'm not so sure about that family. Well, that's okay. God still loves you, and he still wants you there, and we want you here. So we leave this, this door open. Please pick up the phone, call me, text me, email me. Let's talk about the family. If you're not sure that you are a part of this family, that you've accepted Christ, that you have this salvation, you can know it, and you can be firm in it. Abba, Father, loves us, desires that we be a part of this. So that's my prayer for us as a church. All right. Pray with me. We'll close our service. Father God, I thank you again for your message this morning. I thank you for what you have shared. And, and, and I pray, I look at these faces and I think we all know you, but Father, there may be some here that, that just are a little hesitant, a little on the edge, not quite fully sure of their relationship. Father, convict of their hearts. Let them know that you are real. And Father, bring them to a, a, a place, a conversation with me or some of our other leaders that they can be sure that they are walking with you. And Father, for those of us that know you, just help us stay and live and do what we need to be doing for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Tim has a... I, I, uh, I lost